Good morning. We're going to get started here on our first panel of the day. Uh, my name is Chris Fabricant. I'm the Director of Strategic Litigation at the Innocence Project in New York. I uh, had the distinct pleasure of uh, moderating and introducing this um, real all-star team of uh, statistical experts. And I have to say that you know my work um, is all around forensic sciences. And I'm one of the very few lawyers that has had the pleasure of putting somebody like Dr. Cafeter on the witness stand before. And, you know, and I was thinking about what is it that binds all of these experts together, and I think it really has a lot to do with the grossly underutilized rule of evidence, federal rule of evidence, um, the subsections 702 on expert testimony, subsection B and subsection C, that a testimony, proposed testimony be uh, based on sufficient facts or data, and C, that it's based on reliable principles and methods. So the people that we have up here today are experts in this area, and they will hopefully be in a position to educate all of us and the judiciary ultimately on statistics and the law. First, we have Alicia Kirikori. I'm going to give you bio of all three of you first. The, uh, um, Dr. Kirikori. Kirikori? Yes, you're very, very good. <laughs> so PhD in statistics and animal sciences from the University of Illinois. She's a professor of statistics at Iowa State University. Between January of 2000 and July of 2004, she was an associate provost at Iowa State. Her research interests are in Bayesian statistics and general methods. Her recent work focuses on nutrition and dietary assessment as well as problems in uh, genomics, forensic sciences, and traffic safety. Dr. Kira Query is an elected member of the International Statistics Institute and a fellow of the American Statistical Association. She serves as the executive committee uh, on the executive committee of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics and has been a member of the Board of Trustees of the National Institute of Standards and Sciences since 1970, 1997. She's also past president of the International Society for Bayesian Analysis. Please welcome Lisa Kira Query. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. I think that was my, I think that was my CV from when I was about 50. <laughs> but that's okay. Let me see. Um, all right. So first of all, thank you um, for um, to Brandon for organizing this wonderful uh, conference, and Karen and everybody from NIST that is here. Uh, I'm really, really happy to be here and talk to you a little bit about what's happening at CSAFE. So um, I'll talk, uh, this is the first of three talks. I think I'll be a little bit more general in terms of um, talking about the importance of statistics in the evaluation of forensic evidence. And um, I'll repeat a few things that Karen said, but maybe with a little bit of a different flavor. So um, evidence, of course, in criminal and civil cases uh, comes in many different forms. There's biological, there's pattern, there's digital. Uh, there's many others. But uh, with the exception of biological samples um, from which scientists can extract DNA, um, it's uh, th the, the scientific underpinnings of uh, just about every other type of evidence is largely lacking. Um, the, the, uh, this is particularly true for, uh, for what we call pattern evidence. That would be fingerprints, uh, shoe prints, tire treads, um, uh, ballistics, and in this type of evidence that the PCAS report uh, um, uh, named feature comparison type of evidence, uh, forensic practice to this day relies mostly on subjective assessment, and I'll be a little bit more uh, precise in just a little bit. So um, Sue mentioned this earlier today. There is There has been an enormous advance in the technology that's available to science, uh, to forensic scientists. And today, scientists have access to an enormous array of wonderful toys. We have some of those toys at CSA, in CSAVE, actually, to be honest with you. And these, these instruments can result in very, very, very accurate measurements. Those were three varies. <laughs> very accurate measurements. And as an example, for ex uh, to, to give you some, um, Forensic scientists working on trace evidence, uh, they can use things such as uh, laser ablation 
inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. I'm very proud of myself for being able to say that. Um, that measures the elemental concentration in glass to a very high degree of precision. They can tell you that, you know, whatever element is present in three parts per million or things very, very impressive like that. And so the question is, if we find two uh, fragments of glass that have essentially, essentially the same uh, chemical composition, can we then conclude that those two uh, fragments of glass came from the same pane? And the answer is no. The fact that we can measure, of course we cannot exclude uh, the same source as a possibility for those two fragments, but the fact that we can measure elemental composition so very precisely does not answer the question of same source. And this is one of the, I think, uh, problems that we have in terms of, underst of understanding how statistics um, is relevant in, in the evaluation of evidence. So um, I mentioned LA ICPMS as one example of a technology that's now, I'm not going to say common, but it's uh, used in many forensic labs uh, to analyze many types of different uh, evidence. The speed of technological advance has not been even, and in some of, other, in some of the other uh, types of evidence, firearms examination is a prime example, um, there has been less use of technology uh, in terms of uh, making evaluations and comparisons. So if you go to talk with a firearms examiner today, for example, they're still using pretty traditional methods. So you get a bullet from a, from a crime scene, you get a test shot from a gun, and you put both of those under a comparison microscope, you fiddle around until you find uh, coincidental stria, and then, um, and then you try to decide whether those coincidental stria are enough to conclude that this bullet was fired from the putative uh, gun. And what I am describing to you is a process that involves absolutely no measurements of any kind. So this is purely a subjective approach in spite of the fact that you're looking into a microscope and making a comparison. And what do I mean by a, sub a subjective approach? I mean, you know, there's some process that firearms examiners use to determine whether all those striations that seem to cut across the two samples uh, imply a match, uh, imply that these two samples are indistinguishable in some sense. Um, but how many stria do they have to find that seem to go across the two samples before they de declare that this is a match? There's very little guidance. Some guidance that's provided by the AFTI theory of identification, I didn't put the whole thing there, but the theory of identification talks about things such as sufficient agreement or uh, agreement that exceeds the best agreement that was observed between two items uh, that were known uh, to be different. And these are very, very, um, first of all, vague terms uh, that, doesn't, uh, that, that don't provide examiners with a specified threshold that says, you have to observe this much of this before you can decide that these two things match in some sense. And so in, others, in other areas of science, in order to come up with such a threshold, we would be looking at considerations that have to do with sensitivity and specificity and positive predictive probabilities and negative predictive probabilities in order to come up with such a threshold that would say, you know, if you observe this many striations, uh, you're, you should conclude no match. If you observe this many or more than those, you should conclude a match and so on. None of that is present uh, in today's firearms examinations methods. And um, so, uh, Aside from that fact, so we've already, so, so I've, I've tried to establish that in some areas there's, there's a lot of precise measurement going on, in some other areas there's no measurements going on at all, and this is similar when you look at shoe prints, when you look at tire treads, when you look, uh, fingerprints is a little bit of a different story, uh, it's in a different place, let's say, than all the other uh, uh, pattern evidence types. But I think this is uh, pretty much the state of the art in many of the pattern comparison uh, disciplines. Let's suppose that we did have a way to determine pretty precisely when two items are indistinguishable. 
Well, the question is, um, are we done? If we have a method to determine that two items are indistinguishable, can we then say they, they come from the same source, they have a common source? And as I said before, uh, that's, not, uh, that's not a conclusion that follows. So we talk about a coincidental match probability. I, there's other terms for it, but let me use this one. Uh, and that would be the probability that two, match, that two items are indistinguishable, even if they have a different source. And uh, so if you think about it, um, when, when, when the probability of a coincidental match is very high, then obviously the, the item, the evidence, it doesn't have what we might call probative value. So it has very low probative value. It doesn't help you at all. Um, single donor uh, DNA evidence, for example, has very high probative value because we know that the probability of a coincidental match is very low. That has been demonstrated over and over and over again. For pattern evidence and to some extent for trace evidence, the probative value is largely unknown. We don't really know what the probability of a coincidental match might be for most pattern evidence. So, um, so going, to, going back to what the PCAS report said, one could say that uh, for a forensic tool to be scientifically valid, we need to have two conditions at least. One of them is we need to be able to measure uh, the features in whatever it is we're investigating uh, in a precise and accurate way. But the, two, the second condition is we must be able to establish the significance of whatever match we might find. So if we find that two items are indistinguishable, we ne need to take the second step and say, and by the way, this coincidence is very rare. Or, and by the way, this coincidence, you know, this match is common, in, common enough that this means nothing. Uh, the OSAC that has been uh, mentioned today largely focuses on the first of these two needs. How do we measure things precisely? How do we come up with standards that are acceptable to everybody? And I think that uh, CSAFE and our collaborators in NIST uh, are focusing mostly on the second question. How do we establish the significance of uh, whatever coincidence we find between two items? It's not an easy question. So um, ideally, of course, we would like to have, um, we would like to have uh, that the chance that two items are indistinguishable uh, when they have a common source be, ve uh, be very, very high, and at the same time, the chance that they are indistinguishable when they have a different source be very, very, very low. That would be ideally uh, what, what we would like to have. Uh, to compute the probability, so to compute the probability under the first of those two bullets, we just have to know what our instruments are doing. So we need to know the precision of our measurements. To compute the probability of a coincidental match, however, we need to understand um, the frequency with which the features we're measuring, we are measuring, uh, appear in the relevant population. And I have relevant population there in italics because that's a question out and of itself and Harry's going to talk a little bit about that, right? <coughs> or not? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> now you're gonna have to. <laughs> um, and so one of, the, one of the things we're finding uh, as we work in this area is that data are a huge limiting factor. Uh, there's just about in every forensic discipline, uh, there's a dearth of data that will allow us to answer that second question. Uh, there's some efforts underway. Sue mentioned the 3D uh, ballistics database that Alan Shang at NIST is assembling. Uh, there's others. Uh, we are at CSAFE assembling a database of um, uh, Stego images, images that carry payload. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, this is not a part of the NIST agreement, but we're also assembling a database of glass uh, elemental compositions and several others. And so those databases hopefully will start helping um, answer that second question. This is not news, so I, this, has been, um, this has been noted by different groups and different reports. Uh, the, the NRC report of 2009 was already mentioned by both Peter and Karen and uh, uh, Brandon. Uh, the 2016 uh, uh, PCAS report uh, looked at the progress that had been made since 2009 and found out that unfortunately many of these questions that, that were posed in 2000, 2009 had yet to be answered. 
Um, and as a result, uh, there were, and during the Obama administration, there was a lot of uh, movement to try and create groups that would address these questions that arise in forensics, and I won't go up, uh, over that again. But CSAFE, I urge you to visit us, www.forensicstats.org. <laughs> Bless you. Uh, uh, this, uh, you'll see the type of work that we're trying to do in collaboration with NIST at, a, at the center. So what is CSAFE? Again, very quickly, we are a consortium of four universities, Iowa State, California, Irvine, uh, Carnegie Mellon, and Virginia. Um, we have been funded through a five-year cooperative agreement with NIST, and we are uh, almost finishing our third year. And we have a three-fold mission. Uh, we carry out research to try and develop the statistical underpinnings of pattern and digital evidence. Uh, we have a very big mission in uh, trying to engage the forensic uh, practitioners and scientists. Uh, we're working very hard at that. And we also have a mission in education and training for every possible stakeholder. Again, this is something we put a lot of effort into. Uh, we have reached out and have a lot of collaborators. Uh, many are here, as a matter of fact. The American Bar Association, the Defense Forensic Science Center, uh, the University of Maryland, Hebrew University, University of Pennsylvania, hopefully in the works, um, LAPD, we have the Houston Center, the Houston Forensic Science Center, the Iowa Department of Criminal Investigations, the Virginia Crime Lab, I see Linda, the Innocence Project, and many, many, many more. And um, five minutes, I'm, I'll totally be done. <laughs> and uh, we, if you would like to collaborate with us, we'd love to uh, talk. So let me very briefly say a couple of words about the ISU-led uh, projects in CSAFE. We try to work across institutions, but there's typically a lead institution in every project. Uh, we've been spending quite some time in trying to develop algorithms to do automatic comparison of bullets. As uh, Sue mentioned, this wonderful technology, 3D imaging of bullet surfaces. Um, uh, this is where we're working off, and uh, in addition to that, aside, we, we're contributing samples to the NIST uh, online collection, but we're also trying to understand this question of relevant population in the case of bullets. What does, what factors affect the type of striations that one observes in ammunition? Is it a combination of gun and ammunition? Is it the age of the gun? Is it the type of use that the gun has used, has been uh, subject to? And these are the type of factors we need to understand in order to construct a database that can be used as a reference later on for comparisons. We have, um, we have developed algorithms. We're in the process of testing them. Uh, we have been pretty successful so far. Uh, in many thousands of comparisons, we've had one false negative and no, no false positives, which is a little bit of a problem because we would like to be able to understand, to make mistakes so that we can improve the algorithm, but so far we haven't. And um, the, we've been focusing on bullets at Iowa State, but the NIST and the CMU colleagues have been focusing on some, something similar, but using breech face and, and fire pin impressions. This is just the type of uh, work we try to uh, produce. So this is for, this is, I'm not going to tell you how we compute a, a similarity score among bullets, but what we would like for this similarity score, yes, <laughs> what we would like for this similarity score is to take on very different values when we know we have non-mated pairs of bullets and different values again when we have known mated pairs of bullets. And there you see two distributions of scores, the yellow distribution and the gray distribution. For this particular similarity score that I'm talking about, it turns out that, the, um, that this score produces values between like zero and about 0 0.3 or 0 0.4 when we have non-matches and produces values between about 0.6 and 1 when we have matches. So if for this particular data set, for example, this comparison score produced zero errors. Uh, this is an algorithm that was trained on a totally different data set, and so these results are very, very promising. So two slides. Uh, so this machine type of approaches, machine learning type of approaches seem to have a lot of uh, promise in pattern evidence where it's very difficult to come up with a physical model or a statistical model. And uh, we've been applying those in, ma in many other different types of uh, evidence. 
One thing, the, the bottom bullet there, one thing, of course, is that the performance of this type of algorithm depends very strongly, very, very, very strongly, on the data on which this algorithm is trained. So this type of, so the, the lack of data shows up again in, um, in just about anything we do. So as we enter year four in CSAFE, uh, we're trying to think about putting more emphasis on testing uh, the various algorithms that we have been developing in the different partner institutions. Um, and more importantly, on communicating what these algorithms do to practitioners who presumably will be using them in practice. Uh, the interpretation of results is really critical. Um, we're going who knows in which direction, score-based likelihood ratios for those of you in the know, uh, ROC curves, two-step approaches, we don't know. Uh, and of course, uh, communicating clearly uncertainties, assumptions, other qualifiers, this is something that Harry will talk about uh, when presenting results. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll be happy to talk to anybody. Uh, please get in touch. And did I go over? I'm done. You're perfect. You're perfect. <laughs> I'm going to stay seated for this. I introduced Dr. Uh, Hari Ayer, and I, I would encourage everybody to ask questions of our panelists um, throughout the talk. Everybody is encouraged to raise their hands, and if anything is um, of interest or question, I uh, I hate to have anybody run short um, because we have such tremendous speakers. Dr. Ayer received his PhD in statistics in 1980 from Colorado State University. Immediately following, he joined the faculty of that same school in their statistics department. And then from 1985 until recently, Hari was the faculty appointee at the National Institute of Standards and Technology at Boulder. And then from 2007 to 2012, Hari held the position in the Information Analytics Division of Caterpillar, Inc. And from 2012 to 2014, he was part of the analytics group of C. GN Inc. Hari joined NIST um, in Gaithersburg in February 2014, and after moving there, he's been involved in uh, research in forensic statistics, particularly relating to the likelihood ratios for fingerprint and footwear fields, pattern and comparison generally. He's currently collaborating with Steve Lund on these topics. Thank you, Dr. Ayer. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, everybody. And I want to first thank uh, Professor Brandon Garrett and uh, Karen Cathedral, and also CSAFE for giving me an opportunity to come and uh, share some of my work with you all. <clears throat> Sue Ballou mentioned a lot of research going on at NIST uh, in forensic science, and I'm involved in a couple of, of projects that I'll briefly mention, but I'll focus uh, much of the time on expert communication of evidence to decision makers. This is uh, joint work, uh, as is a lot of my work these days, with uh, Steve Lund. Um, <coughs> disclaimer, viewpoints are ours, uh, not shared by anyone else at NIST. And also, we are discussing only what makes sense to us, and we are not claiming that any of this is new. Uh, in fact, much of this is well known to people. Nevertheless, maybe there are some uh, small points of value here. Uh, one of the projects that I'm involved in, there's a group of us working on uh, developing uh, scores, comparison scores for uh, comparing a uh, questioned uh, footwear impression with a uh, reference footwear impression. Uh, we are uh, using uh, machine learning methods that uh, Alicia mentioned and also deep neural network methodology that uh, uh, shows some promise. We were uh, encouraged by the work done by uh, CSAFE folks uh, from UC Irvine and CMU on uh, using deep learning methods in shoe print uh, matching. There's another project that I'm involved in. Uh, NIST is conducting a scientific foundation review on DNA mixtures led by uh, John Butler, who is a NIST fellow and also Sheila Willis, who is here, uh, former Director General of Ireland National Forensic Laboratory. So under their guidance, uh, the study is progressing, and we are, among many things, uh, we are focusing on uh, what claims are made regarding capabilities uh, with the DNA mixture analysis, and what data can 
uh, support, uh, how much of the claims can be supported by data. Now moving on to expert communication of evidence to decision makers or jurors. In our uh, adversarial system, the prosecution presents an explanation as to why the defendant is uh, uh, guilty, or they believe the defendant is guilty, and they support their position by uh, introducing various pieces of evidence. And each item of evidence supports some particular claim in their narrative, and the defense may also present evidence uh, to poke holes in the prosecution theory. Now, uh, some items of evidence are subjected to uh, forensic examination, and uh, when the case goes to trial, the forensic expert may testify and uh, help uh, explain uh, the evidence to triers of fact so that they can uh, assign an appropriate uh, weight to the evidence. And the defense may also introduce uh, experts uh, to support their case. Expert assistance can take uh, different forms. Uh, in pattern evidence, the common uh, approach is expert categorical conclusion, something like the, what's called the ASV approach, um, which is uh, identification, exclusion, or inconclusive, or some variations of these categorical conclusions. Another approach is to present a weight of evidence uh, in the form of a likelihood ratio or a base factor. And here the likelihood ratio is the expert's personal likelihood ratio. And this is theoretically at least supposed to be calculated using proper Bayesian reasoning. However, in practice, uh, inspired by the theory of uh, likelihood ratios, people do uh, arrive at likelihood ratio-like scores uh, numbers uh, using uh, data and models uh, and uh, maybe even some computer algorithms, black box type algorithms. And in many instances, the uh, experts use these scores as if they are uh, probabilistic likelihood ratios. There is a difference between likelihood ratio and score Likelihood ratios have a built-in probabilistic interpretation. And within parentheses, an important piece is for the person who made the likelihood ratio assessment using proper Bayesian reasoning. For instance, if the value of the likelihood ratio is 1,000, then the expert who made that assessment believes, this is an expert belief, that the evidence is 1,000 times more likely under the prosecution hypothesis than under the defense hypothesis. Values greater than 1 support HP, and values less than 1 support HD. This is all well known to you. On the other hand, scores, they try to be likelihood ratios. Uh, uh, they, higher values of the scores support one proposition and the lower values support another proposition. But they don't have a built-in probabilistic interpretation, mm -hmm. not even for the expert who produced the score. But an interpretation may be derived by examining the performance of the scoring system using some ground truth known appropriate reference database. I'll give you a small illustration so with respect to footwear impression comparison, suppose uh, the question impression and the reference impression are as shown in the slide. And uh, a scoring system produces a score of 12.3. Okay, that's the uh, uh, taking into account the correspondence and discrepancies, you get a score of 12.3. That doesn't mean anything to anyone. It's not a likelihood ratio. You can't say that uh, one proposition is 12.3 times more, you know, the evidence is 12.3 times more likely under one proposition than the other. So what do you do? You need to provide context so that the person receiving the information can assign appropriate weight to this uh, finding. 
And how do you do that? Let's say that uh, you are able to uh, find in your reference database, if you have such a database, uh, ground truth known uh, made it pairs of impressions similar to what you're looking at for casework. Let's say you have 1,000 of these. And let's say you also have non-mated pairs of impressions, 1,000 of them, suppose. And you use your scoring system on all of these and produce 1,000 mated scores and 1,000 non-mated scores. You can view those graphically uh, looking at histograms. So the red histograms, the mated scores, the green is the non-mated scores. You can also draw box plots to see some overlapping air regions, like around here there's some overlap, uh, scores around five, where the two distributions are not separated. Now you have the crime scene pair, which gave you a score of 12.3, which sits about there. And what you can say, it's, it's a fact, is that 621 out of the 1,000 mated scores were less than 12.3. So 12.3 sits right in the middle of the mated score distribution. And none of the 1,000 non-mated scores exceeded 12.3. So all the green ones are far to the left. You can also say, if you want, focusing on the region around 12.3, that 87 of the 1,000 mated scores fell in the same bin as 12.3, and none of the 1,000 non-mated scores fell in that same bin. So these are <coughs> empirical facts. Now from this, one needs to deduce how much weight to give to this particular piece of finding. You can fit models and come up with model-based probabilities, but uh, there are a lot of issues relating to fitting models and coming up with probabilities. So uh, I don't want to discuss to this crowd uh, Federal Rules of Evidence 702 or Daubert, but I wanted to focus on the word reliable or reliability. So this is mentioned in 702, and in Daubert, it's a, the reliability word appears twice, error rate word appears, going to the dictionary, my favorite Oxford dictionary, reliability means what? The quality of being trustworthy or of performing consistently well, okay? Or the degree to which the result of a measurement, calculation, or specification can be depended on to be accurate, okay? The degree to which, it's not reliable or not reliable, it's a degree of reliability. So reliability uh, for latent print examination, uh, there's a famous study everybody knows about, the black box study, where the authors focused on the accuracy and reliability of forensic latent fingerprint decisions. That gives an idea of discipline-wide uh, error rates, uh, maybe on good quality latents and uh, poor quality latents. But in, a, in the courtroom during testimony, what is important is the reliability of the testimony that's being given for that case, not discipline-wide error rates. What is the potential error rate for that case? So you need to know the type of uh, evidence you have for that case and also the qualifications of the expert uh, in that case. To our knowledge, uh, I don't know that we have individual uh, level error rates, uh, but that's what we, one needs. Now, uh, Steve and I spent three years Hari, looking. Can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. When you talk about individual error rates as opposed to field error rates, would you uh, just elaborate a little on how that testimony would come out in, in your view? In other words, how would it, an expert who is expressing a conclusion in a latent fingerprint case talk about a field wide error rate versus a personal error rate? Or is that too hard of a question? <laughs> well, uh, no, it depends on the context. Is, uh, is the expert being cross-examined? Well, no, just presenting the conclusions on direct. So then they just present their conclusion. 
Right, but I mean, let's I know, okay. So, so let's talk about cross-examination. Somebody who would affirmatively admit to an error rate on direct. If Hari Ayer were a latent fingerprint expert, how would you express your conclusion in terms of an error rate? I, I couldn't give you an error rate. Okay, so uh, what I guess what I I'm could, getting at. I could tell you I took these uh, proficiency tests and this is how well I did, but. I don't know that that's relevant to this case because in my proficiency testing, I may not have come across similar quality or quantity or type of uh, fingerprint comparison. Right, I guess this is the question I'm asking you is that could you take from a proficiency test the evidence at issue? Could you say that under these particular circumstances, I get the right question when ground truth is known X percentage of the amount of time? Right, where I have this quality of print and I have this level of experience, under these circumstances I get an error rate of X. Does, is that what the, you're proposing? Well, you have to say what is true. So if that's what the information available is, so that's what I would say. Now, I can speculate also, if you allow me to speculate, I would say in, these, in this case I'm pretty sure I'm right. You know, if you let me speculate. Right, okay. But I think there are fingerprint experts here that can say more about that. I'm not a fingerprint expert, but I'm just looking at what I would say based on truth, what I know versus what I consider to be speculation. I see. So uh, I was saying that uh, Steve and I spent three years uh, studying the literature. Uh, you know, we are relatively new to the field, now three years. Uh, and we came across many statements particularly relating to uh, likelihood ratios, uh, and I'll share those with you. Uh, Bayesian reasoning raises concerns with examiner providing categorical conclusions. So likelihood ratio folks don't like examiners expressing categorical conclusions. Likelihood ratio framework is helpful, natural, logical way to consider evidence. Bayesian reasoning says that experts should communicate using likelihood ratio characterizations. That's only logical, coherent, etc. And you should provide a single likelihood ratio uh, uh, as your, uh, as your uh, assessment. So the first two uh, statements we don't have any complaints about, so our, our lips are sealed. The uh, second two, uh, we disagree. So to express these views, uh, Steve and I wrote a paper uh, published in the Journal of Research, uh, NIST Journal of Research, uh, and uh, this paper received mixed reaction from the community. Uh, I should point out that uh, there are at least a couple of rebuttal uh, articles available, one by Professor uh, Jeffrey Morrison uh, it's a very nice uh, uh, article uh, that people should read. Um, he, his response was to a NIST uh, press release of the paper rather than the paper directly. And uh, a second rebuttal which just came out just days ago by uh, Professor Aitken and Professor uh, Nordgaard uh, as a letter to the editor in the uh, Forensic Science, Journal of Forensic Sciences, and their closing sentence is that the concern expressed by London Iyer is unfounded. So uh, people should go read that as well. So uh, our focus uh, in the paper was also on reliability uh, issues with likelihood ratio testimony. For instance, the value of likelihood ratio provided e either is a subjective quantity or is based on models. And many reasonable, plausible models can be identified that are consistent with the data. So you couldn't say this one model is the right model to the exclusion of all others. Each model leads to a different LR value. And I believe, and Steve believes, that it's important to reveal this to the trier of fact. Uh, so that you know there are multiple interpretations that one can have based on data. And uh, the 
different assumptions and models can be organized in a, in a chart like this. We discussed that in the paper. I don't want to go through this. Uh, and one thing that uh, one realizes is that depending on whether your assumptions are weak, you rely more on data, less on assumptions, or less on data and more on assumptions, the final statement or the range of plausible values for LR can vary. So at the very bottom, the black horizontal line shows different LR values that one could get using models that are consistent with the data if you make very weak assumptions, uh, very weak statistical assumptions. The vertical axis shows increasing strength of assumptions, and at the very top, you have a very narrow range of likelihood ratio values because you have a lot of assumptions that rule out uh, models that otherwise would be uh, considered reasonable. So this sort of looks like a pyramid, so we called it an uncertainty pyramid. And in, in actual casework, uh, we think that it would be useful to investigate the effect on LR of multiple assumptions, multiple models, and express them in a, in a form like the ideal uh, uncertainty pyramid picture that I showed. So in summary, uh, we need to pay attention to the reliability of expert testimony on a case-by-case -case basis. Discipline-wide estimates are useful but insufficient. LR framework is useful. Nobody's saying that LR is nonsense. Experts should help the trier of fact in assessing the likelihood of the evidence under the prosecution scenario and also under the defense scenario. So those two things together help the trier of fact uh, assess the weight of evidence. Notice that I'm saying the trier of fact assesses the weight of evidence, not the forensic expert. So there may be some complaints about that point of view. The theoretical foundation for LR does not support the practice where the expert takes upon it himself or herself the task of assessing the weight of evidence and transferring their personal LR to triers of fact. I'm not saying that one should or should not do that. I'm just saying that if anyone says that the Bayesian theory justifies this, then we would disagree. It's important to explore empirical descriptive methods like the one that I showed for the uh, footwear impression situation. And this afternoon, Henry Swafford is going to show more serious version of that that's uh, in use at the Defense Forensic Science Center for fingerprints. In the end, use the most effective method among those available. And the challenge is, how do you identify such a method? So it's not like Bayesian is the way or something else is the way. What works best is what one should use. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ari. Um, lastly, uh, we have Dr. Karen Kafadar, and I have to say that um, when my colleague Dana Delger and I um, recently noticed um, our adversaries, uh, our expert witness notice, they asked me, um, who's Karen Kafadar? And I said, Karen's our Yoda. And so yeah, I think is an appropriate um, designation for uh, Karen, who's been involved in forensics as a statistician for a long time. She's the Commonwealth Professor and Chair of the Department of Statistics at the University of Virginia. She has a PhD in statistics from Princeton University, an MS in statistics from Stanford, and a BS in mathematics from Stanford. Dr. Kafferer's academic focus includes the application of robust statistical methods and exploratory data analysis to physical, chemical, engineering, and biological sciences, and she has published extensively on those and other topics. Dr. Kafferer is a national associate of the National Academy of Sciences, which is a designation awarded to recognize extraordinary contributions to our organization, the NAS, through pro bono services. Dr. Kafferer. Um, okay, thank you. Um, and I'm going to keep this brief because I know that it is I who stands between you and lunch. So um, uh, I've already mentioned that you know statistics has been very successful in, in many areas of science. And so I'm just going to um, mention 
uh, real quickly that, you know, one of the reasons, uh, many reasons why DNA is such a successful forensic method, but it's be in part because they're well-defined markers. It's not just an examiner that goes in and says, well, let's see, I think I'll look at this marker and this one and this one. Um, the, it, those markers, those features, uh, have very high sensitivity and high specificity. So uh, Alicia talked about um, having bullets, you know, um, from the same source. So if I know I've given you uh, two samples from the same source, there's a high probability of saying, yep, looks like the same source to me. Um, and again, if I've given you two bullets from different sources or two samples that were came from different sources, there's a high probability of saying, nope, don't look the same to me. So um, they, they, because they have high, high sensitivity and specificity in the courtroom, of course, you don't have the truth, okay? Only the recording angel knows the truth. So uh, what you're hoping, though, is that there's high uh, predictive value so that if the person expert comes in and says, looks like a match to me, there's a high probability the recording angel has written down her little book, yes, there's a match, and vice versa with uh, respect to if the, it looks like it's not a match. So we're never going to be able to peek inside the recording angel's book, but we do know that there's a connection between high sensitivity and specificity and high predictive value. Um, there were well-designed experiments to validate performance, careful analysis of experimental data, well-defined procedures, and there's still a lot of issues to uh, be um, discussed there. As Hari mentioned, there, there are issues regarding um, uh, mixtures, but one of the um, real uh, strong points here is that uh, there's al always a, um, a challenge here of addressing new challenges and scientists getting together to address what those new challenges are. Um, so uh, two, I'll, I'll mention two uh, studies where statistics actually really helped a lot. Um, and one of them is the anthrax investigation. Uh, this is a cover of the report and um, happily our our judge is not here right now. You'll be hearing from him at lunch, so he won't have to blush when I tell this story, but I just have to tell it. Um, he was on this committee as well, and after the report came out, I sent it to my artsy younger brother who knows nothing about science or the law, um, but to whom else can you brag except your younger brother? So he looked at the table of contents, I think that's about as far as he got, and said, he and his wife called and said, wow! you know Judge Rakoff? <laughs> and I said, have you heard of him? And he said, are you kidding? He lives in New York. He says, he's our hero. He's the only judge that will stand up to um, some of these uh, um, you know, disciplines, especially the banks. So he was really impressed. So mm -hmm. you're, you're about to hear um, at lunchtime. It was a great choice for keynote speaker, and we're really glad that he's here. Um, so how many people even remember the anthrax letters? It was 16 years ago, and mm -hmm. uh, probably some of the students barely remember it um, 17 years ago. But uh, in any event, there were um, uh, spores, anthrax spores, found in uh, letters that were sent to New York City, uh, Florida, and uh, DC. And the ones with the asterisks, asterisks are the ones where uh, anthrax was actually confirmed. And the others were inferred because, unfortunately, people died. Um, the, uh, they, this was a long time ago, and of course, you know, deep sequencing now is available, but at the time they had discovered that there were four specific morphotypes that occurred in the samples that were found in these letters. Uh, so they actually did five assays for these morphotypes. Um, the morphotypes were uh, creatively called A1, A3, D, and E. That's because A2 turned out not to be very useful, or B or C. Uh, now, they actually had two separate labs, I'll call them the M lab and the I lab, that measured D. That was the only morphotype that actually had two different labs. Um, the FBI then subpoenaed all the labs in the country uh, using what was then a select agents list from the Centers for Disease Control, and um, they sent out <coughs> these requests and said, um, dear lab director, if you have any anthrax samples, could you please send them to us? So, um, you know, of course, if you were the perpetrator, not likely you'd probably send them in, but anyway, they did get uh, 1,070 samples into their repository, and they believed it was complete. Uh, the smoking gun was that only eight of those samples showed all four morphotypes. Seven of them came from this so-called Lab F, 
and the eighth one was sent to Batoil Memorial Institute, and that one actually came from Lab F. So the inference was that the anthrax came from Lab F. Well, of course, then you put statisticians on this committee, and statistics means never having to say you're certain. Um, out of these 1,000 samples, they actually came from only 20 labs, okay? Uh, 17 of them were in the U.S., the other three were Canada, United Kingdom, and Sweden, just happen, uh, just by, uh, by happenstance, three countries that are favorable to the United States, friendly with the United States. 11 samples were deemed not viable. There was lab-to-lab -lab variation, so I mentioned only one of those morphotypes was analyzed by two different laboratories. It wasn't 100% concordance, okay? In other words, in, 90, in, in about 92% of the cases, the two labs came up with the same answer, either present or absent. Um, or inconclusive, um, uh, and the other 8%, uh, they had different answers. For reasons that were a little vague, I won't go into it, they ignored whatever was the conclusion from I, um, and so they were left with 947 samples. Now, they did have another study where they um, took one sample that supposedly had um, all four morphotypes, and they measured it 30 times, okay? Not all 30 times did they get the same answer, okay? Only 16 times did they get the same answer. Now, one person may say, well, it's over half. Yeah. Well, yeah, but you got to wonder what would have happened with the other 947 samples if they had measured those 30 times as well. Um, and then there were also some dilution studies where they diluted the, the sample. Of course, if you dilute it enough, you assume it's going to be hard to find the morphotypes. Uh, but it suddenly um, show, it shows up or doesn't show up, so I ended up hitting the button here. So, um, uh, so what was the smoking gun here? Well, I mentioned that there were 20 labs. They didn't have 50 samples from each of the 20 labs, okay? Lab F submitted 598 samples, okay? So now if you were to guess which of the labs might have been the one that submitted seven smoking gun samples, would you guess, for example, Lab J, which submitted only four samples, or Lab K, which submitted only three samples, okay? So right off the bat, you can probably guess if you had a big pond of 947 samples and you tagged uh, 947 fish and you tagged eight of them and then you pulled out 598 of them, a pretty, pretty good chance you're gonna get a fair number of tagged fish. Okay, and it turns out the answer is about 14%. Certainly not common, but it's not incredibly rare. So uh, there were other issues that came up with the anthrax study, but um, you know the conclusion from the report was, was well, maybe, maybe not. So um, uh, it turned out that the person that was implicated actually committed suicide. So in a sense, it was a, it was a, um, uh, what do you call it? A, a, you know, moot point in some sense. Um, and the other one I'll mention quickly um, because it, it relates to the, some current work that um, Alicia mentioned is bullet lead analysis. And this was the uh, report that came out in 2004. And uh, when a crime was committed and they were not able to recover the gun, actually the situation where they did recover the gun was a separate NRC committee and Alicia was on that one. But when there was no gun, then they would do these, you know, comparison of, of trace elements. and. Um, the, the, they would report in analytically indistinguishable concentrations when the mean plus or minus two standard deviations of these uh, concentrations overlap between the two samples. So this is what a picture looks like, and just look at the left one. Um, those were two bullets, the bl black bullet and the red bullet, and the concentrations, um, mean plus or minus two standard deviations is depicted there, and you can see in all, at that, um, the, this particular database, they had only six uh, concentrations. They later expanded it to seven. Um, all of the black and the uh, red intervals overlap. So uh, this was the report that came out, and the statisticians on there said, well, the hypothesis that bullets came from the same box is not feasible. Uh, it's, it, you know, there's just too much variability in the manufacturing process so that different batches might end up in the same box or um, the variability within bullets from the same batch might be too high. So it, was, it turned out to be a, a procedure that was not good for either inclusion nor exclusion. If they were different, didn't mean that they didn't come from the same box because they may have been just separate batches. 
So um, there was a more proper statistical test. There was an ISU technical report that had come out. Alicia was on that one as well. They also pointed out that um, there was a better statistical test. Uh, historical data suggested that the measurements were actually more correlated than they thought. And by doing some simulations, we discovered that actually the error rates were higher than they had predicted um, point, uh, uh, four. Instead of 0.04 percent, um, it was more like uh, perhaps as much as 9 or 10 percent chance of making a, a false um, positive. So um, uh, just as a, a kind of postscript here is that the forensic glass evidence now is, is uh, quite similar in many respects to the, the bullet lead. Um, there are right now three glass standards uh, proposed for the OSAC registry. Um, one of them, they differ only in terms of the actual method, uh, scientific method, a chemical technique that they use. Uh, one of them has been approved already. Um, uh, one of them, the second one is, is to be approved. And the, then there's the third one. I'm going to be talking mostly about the data from the third one. Similar to CBLA, they're going to um, measure concentrations of trace elements. Uh, the standards have 8 to 17 elements. Uh, and <coughs> uh, they suggest a minimum of three measurements, as they did in bullet lead, for the known and the recovered samples. And then instead of doing um, mean plus or minus two standard deviations for the two samples, they'll do mean plus or minus four standard deviations here and then just look to see if the mean falls in. So uh, it, that's um, uh, algebraically uh, not too different except that they're using only one set of standard deviations. So it sounds more promising because they have 14 elements, but sort of the way I think of big data, more data doesn't necessarily mean more information especially if the, um, the measurements are correlated. So uh, Karen Pan, who's in the audience here, um, uh, took the publicly available data um, basis to estimate expected variations in glass measurements by looking at the same fragment, different fragments from the same pane of glass and different panes of glass. Uh, the data um, came from Germany and Canada, both of whom had very good studies. Um, there's a, another uh, database where um, it's just casework, and so the samples are all quite, quite varied. Mm -hmm. And um, the uh, third technique, um, there was actually no data for it. <clears throat> but this gives a depiction of how different, between the Germany and the Canada um, samples, how different the correlation matrices look. Um, the left and the right is just classical and robust. Um, and top and bottom are um, Canada and Germany, and you can see that the um, just by the pictures look different. They look quite similar between the classical and the robust, but they look quite different between the different laboratories. So this is why it's important to have lots of labs uh, collecting data so we can see just how much variability there is. Um, but the, uh, um, I'm going to actually skip to the last one because um, we're running out of time. These are ROC curves, and uh, the question is what's the sensitivity and the specificity of the procedure? Uh, in an ROC curve, you want to be as far to the upper left corner as possible. And um, if, if the um, glass fragments are this different, it's very, very highly probable you're going to be up in that upper left corner. But if they start getting kind of close, then it starts getting to be less easy to distinguish uh, whether the samples actually came from the same source or a different source. And um, in fact, uh, the um, the, the values there are, you know, just how different they are. The ones that are really close, that red line, um, corresponds to about 22 dif percent difference in the concentrations in each of those 14 elements. So it's a, a little worrisome, but um, uh, the statistical methods are essential for identifying sources of uncertainty, um, bias, and uh, imprecision, uh, quantifying the effects of uncertainty, uh, it's also important for just good design of realistic validation studies. Uh, we hope we can also contribute to uh, good data collection, appropriate analysis of the data, and formulating some valid justifiable inferences from the data. And that's all. Thank you so much. So we're only a few minutes late. Yes, we're doing good. Thank you. Sure, I got it. Excellent. So that, that wasn't a great question. I was trying to get.
get you to say that, that, that you can never, that you can never opine a particular piece of evidence in the trial. I should have, like,